Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm your host, Roshan Hovsepian, a pediatric oncologist from Armenia. And today on Onco Daily, we have a very special guest joining us, a true luminary expert in the field of pediatric oncology, Professor Rob Peters. Uh, welcome, Professor Peters. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you here on Onco Daily. My pleasure. Uh, so uh, I know that there is no need for introduction because everyone knows you, but uh, still, uh, Professor Peters is the Chief Medical Officer at the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology and Professor of Pediatric Oncology at the University of Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands. He's the Editor-in-Chief of the European Journal of Cancer uh, for Pediatric Oncology. His research primarily focuses on personalized therapies for childhood uh, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, and uh, he holds a lot of uh, leadership positions uh, and advisory boards. Uh, he is a member of advisory boards of cancer-related institutes and organizations globally. And uh, finally, he's the uh, uh, new uh, president-elect of International uh, Society of Pediatric uh, Oncology, for which I would like to congratulate you. And I know that you will uh, make a wonderful leader um, also on this platform. So, um, all right, so then let's start. Uh, so uh, let's begin uh, our conversation by exploring uh, the origin of your uh, journey in pediatric oncology, how, how you decided to start uh, working in pediatric oncology and what initially sparked your interest in this field? Um, yeah, it is a little strange to start perhaps, but I started to study human movement science because I wanted to do research in the field of uh, rehabilitation, physical therapy, and those kind of things. And um, after a year of doing that, I learned in my idea very well how to do research, but I didn't learn too much about the field where I wanted to do my research in, in the future. So I decided to start in addition to that uh, medicine. So uh, to have one study focused on more doing research and the other more on the, uh, on the practical things, so in the medical field. And during my study in medicine, I saw two children dying from cancer. And then I thought, oh, this is much more important uh, field of doing research to, to help children with cancer to develop better therapies. And so I thought, well, I'm going to direct on that. So uh, this is the way how I got involved in, in, in the pediatric oncology world. And so at the end, I finished both uh, studies. So I had, I thought, a very good profile to do both research and care in uh, for children with cancer. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, you started uh, in a completely different field and now you are in pediatric oncology. And it's also truly inspiring how the patient experience can shape our uh, career. And uh, I'm sure that on your uh, during your uh, training, uh, you had a lot of mentors and I would like uh, to uh, hear your opinion, uh, how you would define the mentorship and uh, could you also explain us uh, the role of mentors throughout your journey? Yes, and, and that's, a, that's perhaps even difficult to ask because there were so many people that you learn something from. But what I what I think is is the person that I learned most of in my in my let's say in my uh, uh, career was in my first year when I studied human movement science. I we had a teacher uh, uh, in the field of philosophy of science, and he inspired me a lot about uh, how to do research, but mainly about our own limitations, that many things we think, think are true, that they all are based upon now the concepts of how we think and how to do research, and uh, that also these, these principles can change during history and will change in the future. So we are quite limited in what we think we can do or how to make the world better. And uh, so everything is very limited, uh, what, what we as human beings can send do. That, that was, I think, the most inspiring teacher I, I ever had, yes. And that, that changed my view on the, on the world and it changed my view of studying something, uh, how limited we are. 
No, that thank you for sharing sharing that, and also being a, a young uh, oncologist, I feel the role of import uh, the importance of mentor uh, day by day, especially if you are working in a low resource setting. Uh, mentors are crucial uh, that can help you and guide you. People who have a lot of experience, they can completely change your uh, mindset. So, and uh, also uh, throughout my short career in pediatric oncology, I've encountered some uh, patients whose stories have left a lasting impact on me. And I'm sure that uh, you have uh, seen. Uh, could you uh, discuss any memorable uh, stories that have had a profound effect, uh, impact on your career? Yeah, there, well, there are ma- I'm relatively old already. So there are many, many, many patients that I still remember and uh, and each patient has its own uh, story, uh, but uh, yeah, there are a few memorable patients. Uh, I don't know how much time you have, but I will, I will, I will try to give you a few examples or one example. Perhaps it was a, it's it's always difficult if you have to to talk with a child um, that will die because there are no curative treatments uh, available anymore. And I remember one story that I I talked first to the parents. Oh, this was a girl of six years old uh, with a certain tumor. And I talked first to the parents, of course, that, that we could not cure anymore and, and that she was going to die. And nobody knew when, but it would probably will take a couple of months before she would die. And of course, the parents were extremely uh, sad and, and, and crying and and they asked me how how shall I tell this to to our daughter, and so I said, well, let me do it because then it's so difficult to find the words. Let me speak to your daughter, and then you can notice which words she will use, and then you can start from there. So, I uh, in 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 the next talk I talk with uh, with uh, this patient with this young girl, and with her parents together and. So I said to this to this girl, I don't have any pills anymore that I can completely cure you. And as some young children then simply straightforward say, am I going to die? And I said, yes, you are going to die, but not tomorrow. It's not that after one night's sleep you will die. It will take one hundred of nights. So that it's that she realizes that it's not tomorrow, but it's far away. And then she asked me, am I going to heaven? So I said, yes, of course you're going to heaven. Why, 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 why do you think you will not go to heaven? And she said, well, uh, I want to go to heaven because my grandmother and grandfather are there. Oh. I said, okay, yeah, of course. So you go to your grandfather and grandmother. So you, of course you will go to, to heaven to, to meet them there. And then she turned to her parents and she said, I hope you will come soon also. <laughs> and this was, it was, was funny and very sad at the same time point. But this is how children think of that age. They think very practical. And for the parents, this was a way of, this is actually their daughter uh, made, the way free for them to talk with her about death and what is behind death or after death, I must say, what is after death and whatever religion you have or you have, I'm not religious, but it helps parents to choose the words with their child to, to speak about death. And uh, so this, this was say, and, yeah. and let's say and a story that I will never forget, but there are so many stories like this, so many stories. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine. And uh, that is the wonderful thing of working with children. And you will never expect uh, what they are going to say. And uh, that is actually the most uh, uh, wonderful thing I, uh, I, I find in pediatric oncology. And um, speaking of collaboration, you are currently serving as the chief medical officer of Princess Maxima. And uh, how um, you uh, uh, could you share with us uh, how the, the inspiration behind the establishment and how it has revolutionized pediatric cancer care in the Netherlands? Yeah. 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 Well, we had before the Princess Maxima Center uh, uh, came, we had seven childhood cancer centers in the Netherlands. and. Um, 
and of course every center was was a good center and, and i was chairing one of these seven centers and at a certain day my colleagues my six colleagues and myself we sat together uh, how to divide research money we we obtained research from a foundation uh, we received the money from a foundation and we talked about how to divide this money and of course everybody wanted to have slightly more than one seventh of this amount of money uh, and so we we asked ourselves the question if 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 your grandmother saves 1000 euro would she be happy if we divide it by seven or should we give it to the best researcher well my grandmother would be happy if we would give it to the best researcher but who's the best researcher of us who has the best researcher and six of them by definition cannot be the best because can only be one of the best but how can we solve this because then one will get the money and the other six will not get anything and so if the best research does not work in your own center how do you deal with it and why are you doing this actually and the second even more important question was if your own child would get cancer to to who would you go in the netherlands mm. would you go to your own center with a child with a brain tumor or with a child with leukemia or a child with a sarcoma or a lymphoma who's the best who has the best team of us for each type of cancer you cannot be the best in all these things and would you go with your own child to a second best center? Or would you go to the best center? Well, I would know what I would do. And everybody knows what you would do. So how to solve this? And if you would go with your own child to another center, why are you doing this? Probably for your own ego and probably for your own institution, but not for this child. So we said, if we work together, if we would all merge everything into one new national childhood cancer center, then my grandmother will be happy. The money will go to our best researcher instead of just dividing it a little by everybody. And every child in us will get the best team that we have, the best team available, not only your own child, but every child. And this was basically the principle of the Princess Maxima Center. So we decided to merge everything to start not only with the professional, but also with the parents' organization, which was very much in favor uh, of this initiative. Uh, so we, this initiative was taken by and the parents' organization uh, and the Dutch Childhood Oncology Group. And they together, they started the Maxima and they are still uh, the owner of the Princess Maxima Center. And by this, we created the largest childhood cancer center in Europe, which was never the goal itself, but it was a side effect of the merge of all research, all care we have. So now we have a very large childhood cancer center. Uh, so we work with about 600 uh, researchers, about 900 people in the care, and about 150 to 200 people in the supportive departments, the finance, the HR, and those kind of things. And um, uh, so we now exist for more than five years, almost six years actually already. And and we don't only want to make the difference for Dutch children with cancer because there are only, luckily, only 600 children with cancer in the Netherlands. But there are 25,000 children with cancer in Europe and uh, three to 400,000 children with cancer worldwide. So we hope we can use our expertise also to help other centers in the world and mainly East and South Europe, but also in some countries in Africa and Indonesia to help these countries building up better childhood cancer centers so that we can really, well, we have a mission like many other institutes have a mission to cure every child with cancer, but then you cannot limit yourself uh, to the Netherlands. That would be quite stupid. No, that's uh, truly inspirational. And also, uh, it's uh, the model of Princess Maxima was something that uh, our center, Pediatric Cancer Blood Disorders uh, Center in Armenia, took uh, inspiration from. And uh, we implemented the same approach. We uh, unified all the centers in one and uh, in 2019. And I think, uh, especially if the country is small, it's uh, very important uh, to have only one center centralized. And also, I part 
participated in the master course uh, for uh, Princess Maxima and uh, when you enter the center, you feel that science is uh, going there and um, it's, uh, it's uh, of course, uh, one of the largest um, centers in Europe and it's uh, something that uh, you would like uh, to have uh, also in your center. And uh, now going back to pediatric oncology research, uh, how do you envision the future of pediatric oncology, particularly in terms of advance advancements in research and treatment? I know that this is a very broad question, but I just want uh, to hear your opinion. What uh, you think that uh, has uh, an immense promise now? Yeah, well, the classic three options for therapy, surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy, we, we know them for 50, 60 years, uh, they are used in pediatric oncology. Uh, but of course, the new immunotherapeutic approaches are, are extremely promising and, and very important to incorporate these into our uh, therapies and also in our first line therapy. So there's a lot to do uh, there, a lot to win there. It took us 50, 60 years to come to the current standards of chemotherapy and radiotherapy and surgery and even after 50, 60 years, we are still improving these three uh, modalities of treatment. But to incorporate this fourth uh, uh, modality of treatment, the immune therapy, uh, therapeutic approaches, that's extremely important. And that's not done in five or 10 years. That will take much more time than that. Uh, so the antibodies, the, um, the, the bispecific antibodies, the antibody drug conjugates, the cellular therapies, the CAR T cells, especially, but there may also be other cell therapies uh, that are coming up. So that is a, an in, in incredibly important development. And that's probably the most important development uh, from the last five to 10 years. And I've never seen such a change in the concept of treatment during my life. Um, on the other hand, still also working on precision medicine. And precision medicine, I mean, not only targeted therapies for specific genetic abnormalities, but which is an important thing, but also uh, based upon the molecular genetic abnormalities and the response to therapy, so the response to the first courses of chemotherapy, uh, adapt the intensity of treatment. Uh, and there's a lot of development also there in the different fields of cancer. So like the mission of the Princess Maxima Center, it's also the mission of SIAP, it's the mission of everybody, increasing the cure rate and increasing the quality of survival, so decreasing the side effects. And those are two things that should go well together. Uh, and if we think of that already in the 70s, we could cure uh, about one third of children with cancer with relatively mild therapies. And we increase therapies for everybody. So it's important to decrease the therapy for those for whom it can be reduced while maintaining the high survival. And at the same time, look very carefully to the uh, to how to improve the therapy and cure more children uh, uh, for those who cannot be cured at, uh, at the moment with more, let's say, uh, specific uh, therapies. And both things can go very well together. That, that's the major challenge. And worldwide, of course, yeah, there's a much more important challenge to make these therapies available for everybody because the most of our children have no access to this uh, to these treatments and that's where i see a lot of opportunities so sometimes people think you cannot do let's say high brows research and also take care of uh, working together in uh, with countries or sites outside uh, our privileged uh, countries uh, to, to help children there but you can do both we should do both uh, so it's it's um, that's also very important to to with training programs and international collaborations make the therapies available for for everybody and not only uh, children uh, in countries that can afford everything yeah, that's uh, very true. And uh, I um, see every day in our uh, daily practice that if uh, the accessibility of drugs, especially for the new drugs, is uh, a huge challenge uh, for uh, developing countries. And hopefully uh, in future, we will have uh, some solutions uh, for that. And um, 
For the next question, uh, you hold a lot of leadership positions and uh, I would like uh, to know uh, what is leadership for you and uh, what qualities make an effective leader, uh, especially in the field of pediatric oncology and also what strategies uh, you use for effectively managing and motivating a team, especially for Princess Maxima. I know that it's a huge team and uh, yeah, what are your uh, yeah. strategies? Uh, well, I don't have that many strategies, to be honest. I, 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 I follow my intuition. And uh, sometimes I say uh, to people, forget all these management courses and leadership courses. It's, it's nice to, to, to look at, but follow your intuition and probably then you do the good thing. Uh, and always... Well, try also as a, as a leader to, to be a leader with the goal, with the simple goal of curing more children. So the golden rule is always, what would you do for your own child? Would you do, a sp if, if, for instance, if you open a, a phase one, two study in children with cancer, would you expose your own child to such a treatment? If the answer is yes, then you're doing the good study. If the answer is no, you don't do the good study. So leadership is, I think the most important is, to be an inspiration for other people and always to keep close to your mission and not let yourself distracted by other uh, things that may be that, that may seem very attractive so always keep course uh, follow your mission follow your heart and don't make things complicated the world is not complicated the world is extremely easy but people may make, make it complicated uh, and uh, and and yeah and and if you're a uh, good i think part of the good leadership is also in walking around not by having many meetings but walk around uh, in your center where you work and also at the international meetings but work walk around in your center and just uh, talks in the corridors those are more helpful than any type of scheduled meeting so just walk around and have your ears open and, uh, and stay close to yourself and, you know, and smile. <laughs> that helps. That yeah, helps. Be optimistic. Be optimistic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, actually, it's a strategy that can be used for uh, for every leader. And um, continuing on that, uh, what motivated you to run for the presidency of the site? Of what specific goals uh, do you want to achieve during your uh, presidency? Yeah, well, it, it, it's part of the phase of life where I'm in that, that I spend a lot of time with with others, of course, to to establish the Princess Maxima Center. I spend a lot of my working life into research and care for uh, patients. A lot of re research in the field of leukemia, and I realize that with all these things, you can, if you do research, if you do care, you should also organize things better. Uh, that's a very important, and therefore I probably run into different positions in, 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 in all kinds of, of groups and advisory boards for in the field of childhood cancer. And for the presidency of SIOP, uh, well, several people approached me, and this sounds arrogant, but I don't mean it arrogant. Uh, Rob, you should do this, and this is something that fits with you in your phase of life and with your experience. So I thought, yeah, why not? And it fits also in where I what I said in the beginning of this interview that uh, perhaps I can use what what yeah my experience in in bringing people together, not only in the Netherlands but also internationally. That is, and thereby at the end, making yeah the 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 future for children with cancer better than it's now, and not only in the Netherlands but worldwide. Yeah, I know that you will succeed uh, in that, and I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you are going to work also on that field and um, continuing again on that so you have a lot of leadership positions um, clinical uh, research and uh, how you maintain your work-life uh, balance <laughs> it's you know childhood cancer is part of of my life it became part of my life and and many journalists or many journalists, very regularly journalists ask me, how can you separate these? I can't. 
I can't. And this does this does not sound like that I'm holy or that I'm the Pope or whatever. It's but it's it would be strange if you can completely separate these things, which doesn't mean that I don't like to do other things than than being busy with uh, children with cancer. But uh, it is such an impressive field where we work in. It's it's so demanding. Uh, seeing children with cancer and, and seeing children dying and trying to improve this, that I cannot separate it. And it, it's so uh, there's not a day in my life that I'm not involved in something with with children with cancer, uh, also on holidays. But it doesn't matter because I can I can I can combine it, but you need to invest a lot of yeah energy uh, in it. But you know. I think that work is an essential part of our life. If nobody would work, nothing would improve. Um, so, um, and it makes me also feel good that when I will die in the future, I, you, you never know when, but um, let's hope it will take a long time. But I have the, the feeling that I did something useful in my life. I hope. I hope I did. It's it's for others to judge on that, but that that's also why you, I cannot separate these things. Yeah, that's so nice to hear. And uh, uh, could you recommend any books or resources that uh, have been particularly influential for you during your career? Um. Well, there is one book that I always recommend to people. The, um, unfortunately, it's only written in Dutch, but it it's in English. The translation, the title is The Unconscious Brain. Hmm. And we think we are very rational people. We think we are very organized. And if we have to take a decision, you think, oh, these are the positive things. These are the negative things. But this book, The Unconscious Brain, shows us a very painful conclusion. Which, which is, and this is all the scientific research that is done in the field of the unconscious mind, shows that we take all important decisions from our unconscious mind. Mm. It goes so quickly that we, after that, after we've taken the decision, we try to find the arguments that fit with the conclusion. If you buy a house, for instance, and if, if it's very old and actually it's a ruin, you say, oh, this is a very romantic house. It has character. And then you're going to find the arguments that fits because you like the house. So all and all these important decisions you make are not rational. And this book inf well, influenced me. Yeah, I think it did. It, it's, it shows how limited we are. I already said this also in the beginning of the interview. We are not that smart. Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. Um, and and another book that is more or less in the same direction is that major inventions in in of human beings are not are almost always uh, invented at the same time at different places, which in the world, which means that. The, the major inventions are not because people are so smart, but because the time is right, the time is there, that some things have to be discovered. Not because the, uh, pe uh, people thought of it, but because the time is right, that the mind is ready for it. So that's, that's also, uh, uh, yeah, to make us more modest about how we think we can shape the world. I will definitely check all of that two books out. And um, about uh, beyond your professional uh, pursuits, uh, what do you enjoy doing for fun? Um, I we have uh, we live on a lake, so we go uh, sailing or by motorboat on the lake. And what I like most is playing padel, which oh. is a very famous sport in Argentina and in Spain and. And which is extremely growing in the Netherlands at the moment. And I like to play, I, I used to play tennis and, and I used to play soccer. 
Uh, but playing padel is 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 also is very nice. Yeah, so I like to do that. I do it as as often as I can. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, what would what advice would you give to young pediatric oncologists? Uh, well, don't. Well, how should I say this? Never let somebody stop you. So just follow what you think is good. And of course, you should have a, 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 good, a good vision or mission. I must say a good mission and follow your mission and don't let anybody stop you from that. Uh, that's important that's for like whatever reason. Yeah, that's a uh, wonderful advice uh, because uh, while well, um, I had some experiences during uh, my uh, fellowship that uh, I wanted to do something and uh, a lot of people were uh, forcing me not to do that. But at the end, when I did that, uh, I succeeded. And uh, that is something that uh, reminds you that um, even if uh, people think that uh, you cannot do that, uh, but you should be confident, uh, in, uh, you should be self-confident so that you can succeed in life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and let nobody say that self-confidence is the same as being arrogant. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's very correct. Those are two different things. Yeah, excellent. So, Professor Peters, thank you very much for uh, your time and thank you for accepting our invitation. It was an absolute pleasure for me. Uh, and I hope uh, to see you uh, during... Uh, pediatric meetings uh, in future. Okay, well, I hope to see you also. Uh, you're young enough to attend a lot of meetings, so <laughs> I hope I can, I can do it also, yeah. Okay, thank you, my pleasure. Thank you.